Good afternoon, everybody. This is Scott Carson with Powered by MRP and uh, excited today to uh, talk to uh, Joe Lynch. Um, many of you know Joe because he's been in the industry for 30 years in sales and marketing and one of the core uh, sectors of our industry, uh, uh, smoke filtration and evacuation. Uh, he's been with Buffalo Filtration Systems for a very long time, which was recently acquired by uh, ConMed, which many of you I'm sure uh, sure watched and heard about. And uh, uh, we always think about um, kind of uh, filtration and evacuation as an, as an afterthought to the purchase, at least in, in our world. People will call us up and uh, or email us and, and buy energy-based devices. And then somewhere on that phone call, they'll say, well, do I really need a smoke evacuation or filtration system? Is it something I really have to have? And uh, we explain to them that uh, it's incredibly dangerous to be breathing in these uh, pathogens and allergens and that it's really equivalent, something I learned recently, to a pack of cigarettes, uh, a single procedure or a group of procedures in a room. And uh, so Joe spent the last 30 years kind of educating and training and developing and designing and patenting and engineering all of these devices. And I uh, thought it'd be a great opportunity to actually um, talk to Joe and get everybody to understand the facts regarding filtration and evacuation um, kind of uh, head on. Um, so, uh, Joe, welcome to, uh, uh, to the podcast and uh, appreciate you taking some time out of your day. I know you're busy traveling to uh, to kick some things around with us. Oh, yeah, appreciate it, Scott. I love, love the opportunity to talk about this topic. It's an important one, for sure. You know, let's go back uh, a long time, 30 years. Uh, for you and I, that's kind of hard to remember that far back. But uh, what got you going in smoke uh, evacuation? You know, for me, um, even for me, it's always been an afterthought until recently, uh, yeah. When I thought about my own health and watched the um, even hair removal in our space, uh, the airborne particles. But what was intriguing to you that got you kind of on this path? Yeah, you know, as we were talking about when we met recently, you know, early in my career, I was involved in some patient warming and cooling products during uh, surgery. And, you know, I would go in and out of operating rooms and, and clinics and, and things like that. And I was, I was sort of appalled by the odor that you'd smell in the room and, and kind of that burning flesh, burning hair um, smell. And the rooms would just be billowing with smoke. You know, they'd be filling up with smoke. And I, and I used to sit there thinking to myself, uh, you know, why is this, why is this allowed in a, in a medical facility or in a, in a treatment room? And really didn't know anything about the, what was uh, in the smoke, if you will just that there was a lot of it, right? And the odor was was pugnant. And so I, I got intrigued by it and um, had an opportunity where a company that, that I was working for was acquired by uh, uh, somebody out of Michigan and wasn't really interested in moving there at the time. And through a friend, I met these folks at, at Buffalo Filter um, that had this uh, company and they kind of told me the story and, and, you know, a little bit about what's in the smoke. And what I was surprised about was that it was this little company of 40 individuals outside of Buffalo, New York, and they were well known in the industry. Like people knew them as the experts. So I, I listened to the story and I, I was just enthralled by it and said, you know, this is something I've got to get involved with. And, you know, there's no better cause to me than, you know, protecting those that, you know, protect us, help us uh, look better in, in, in our daily lives and really take care of us. And it's been highlighted as, you know, over the last couple of years to the importance of, you know, caring for those that care for us. And, you know, that's really what drew me in. And as I started learning more, I was just shocked that this was allowed, you know, it was allowed to occur in facilities and um, really took up the cause. You, you, you touch on that. Um, you said you were shocked. So I don't believe that I fully comprehend, and I know that the vast majority of the watchers and listeners to this, and this is really the key objective of this uh, podcast is education and conversation. What are the risks associated with these airborne electrosurgical and laser or IPL and energy-based particles? What, yeah. what does the, the, the risk profile look like? Sure, sure, yeah. and and. Um... You know, you mentioned that you kind of touched upon it that, you know, it's the equivalent of 27 to 30 cigarettes over the course of a day. That study was done in, in a plastic surgery unit in the UK, but, you know, the numbers are, are pretty similar across the spectrum. And really that what, 
when you think about smoke, I mean, smoke in general at space level is harmful to breathe in, you know, mm -hmm. day in and day out. But the, 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 the constituents of this smoke are even more um, challenging in the fact that there's really three main elements. I call them the PCB properties, but you've got physical um, uh, particles that are being expelled in the air, some of them 100 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. So not anything that you could see, you know, or, 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 or um, certainly um, see them even landing on surfaces and so forth, but you're breathing those tiny little um, microscopic particles into your lungs. And, you know, for, for those that are in healthcare, you know that your body has, you know, filtration mechanisms built into filter out dust particles that are um, floating around in the air. But when you get down to particles that are 0 0.01 microns, um, your body can't filter those out. So they end up depositing in the deepest areas of your lungs. They can cause things like infection. They can cause things like COPD and aggravation of those conditions. And essentially your body can't flush them away. Um, the, the second part of it is the, the chemical aspect of it. And there's been numbers of studies that have been done that, you know, identify some of the same chemicals that you see in cigarette smoke. So mm -hmm. benzene and toluene and formal, uh, formaldehyde and things like that, that are very harmful substances, but at a greater concentration level than you would see in cigarettes, right? So you've got the same risks, if you will, of smoking, you know, when you're working on patients day in and day out. And, and as we all know, that's kind of a chronic, you know, condition. It's not something that you're going to walk out of a an operating room or a clinic room and, you know, develop cancer. But it's again, it's a it's a chronic exposure issue, right, that you're being exposed to smoke and chemicals. And I always tell people that that smell that we all are familiar with, anybody that's stepped into a treatment room or know our room, those are chemicals, right? That's what our nose is detecting, right? It's, it's, it's the combustion of those uh, materials, the tissue, the hair, you know, um, muscle, things like that, that you're smelling and that those are the chemicals that are ripe um, within, within that plume. And then you've got the biological material as well. So bacteria and virus has been shown to, to be viable and live within plume, because if you think about it, smoke mm -hmm. is mostly moisture vapor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's 90 plus percent moisture vapor. And what, a, you know, what better vehicle do you have to transmit virus and bacteria than, than in water, right? So it's airborne, yeah. airborne petri dish. It is exactly. So it comes up into the breathing zone of, you know, the, the people that are, are performing these treatments and, um, it, you know, you can breathe that in. So essentially whatever the, the patient has, you've got that risk of exposure. Now it's, you know, that it's random, right? You could, you know, maybe you pick it up, maybe you don't. And, and for often, uh, for, for many of us, you know, if, if I develop a, a cold or the flu, I don't know essentially where I, I got it from exactly, but you know, it, it's, it's a risk. It's a risk that you could be breathing in, you know, bacteria and virus in the patient that you treat because plume can carry those microorganisms. So there's really three, you know, very powerful, very dangerous elements of the plume that take it a step beyond what you would see in cigarette smoke. So then tie that together with, um, you know, obviously that's incredibly concerning looking at those three possible rather significant uh, attributes of airborne particles from lasers and energy-based devices. What are examples of what the, the, the impact would be to a person that is breathing this day in and day out without proper evacuation? Yeah, well, again, I'm going to speak to a couple of examples. Um, when I first started in, in this industry, um, I went to um, a place you're, you're quite familiar with, McCormick Center in Chicago, right? I was at a uh, college of surgeon show there. And I, I saw this gentleman who I knew was a prominent oncology surgeon um, that was approaching me. And, and I had met him once before, and he had this large kind of manila envelope in his hands, right? And um, I knew him to be, you know, sort of guy, great shape, avid runner, you know, really took good care of himself. And so he walked up to me and he said, Joe, you know, he goes, I'll, I'll help you in this cause. I, I believe in it. And he goes, and anything I can do to support your efforts, happy to do so. And started telling me the story about he noticed when he was out on a run um, that he was struggling breathing. You know, his, his, his breath was more labored. He didn't have the energy level that he did, thought maybe he was working too much. So, you know, went to see his general practitioner and 
the the gentleman um, said to him, he said, well, Mark, when, when did you take up smoking? Right. And he said, you know me, you've known me for 20 years. He goes, you know, I, I, I don't smoke. He goes, well, I'm, your lungs are telling you a different story, right? Mm -hmm. So he started going through in his mind what his risk factors were. Nobody in the house smoked, you know, and he really kind of came to the conclusion that it was the smoke he was breathing in every day in his, in, in his occupation that was, was causing this. So he started evacuating the plume and managing it and his condition cleared up, you know, and became a, a believer in, in managing it and, you know, really uh, making sure that, you know, he wasn't exposing himself or his staff to it. And then, you know, we, we've had many other instances of people coming forward. We're talking to somebody right now, uh, uh, an OR nurse, um, and, and this could be in a, in a laser facility, it could be in a, in a clinic, you know, this, these stories are all the same, but a, an OR nurse with, again, no uh, pre-existing conditions, no, you know, smoking in her family or around her, and she's battling stage four lung cancer right now and um, really fighting for her life. And she, again, attributes it to 30 years of being in an operating environment, breathing in smoke. And, and it seems like almost every week I have these stories coming forward. And I always tell people that if you dispute anything that I tell you about what's in the smoke or what the studies say, um, at the end of the day, smoke is not good to be breathing in, especially on a daily basis. And essentially you're breathing in another human being's tissue that you're interacting with. And at a, you know, at a, foundational level that's just not good um, for your health and it will it will really um, present itself as the same types of conditions that you would have from breathing in smoke or secondary um, smoke on a regular basis right trouble breathing headaches nausea burning eyes you know those types of things that over time can lead to more serious conditions I had no idea that the impact would be so f severe. Um, you know, you think about it and you think, okay, maybe it's here and there a little bit, but I guess over the, uh, um, you know, the life of these procedures, I think what's interesting is, is ORs have a relatively small and concentrated treatment uh, uh, time and profile where aesthetics offices are running all day. Uh, some of them seven days a week. And, so you really would, I'm, I'm assuming, multiply or multiply the risk component or shorten, um, you know, the the time that you would see possible uh, changes in your uh, your lung capacity or overall health. Given that over 30 years is one thing, but if you're doing three to four times the amount of treatments in, in a sim same period of time, um, your your risk profile is going to profile is going to go up. Here's a, here's something that. Uh, that obviously you have a global, you know, market in uh, in ConMed, and uh, we know ConMed is a is a leading global company. And Buffalo, the same thing. Buffalo devices are found all over the world. I assume that this is not just a U.S. issue. You know, we're a U.S. podcast primarily, but uh, we do have a lot of uh, people that watch us around the world. This, I assume, is an issue all over the place. This is not just limited to the U.S. It is, yeah. You know, there's it's a it's a global issue, and in in many respects, there are countries around the world that are well ahead of where we are in terms of identifying this as an issue and and really doing things to address it, whether it be through standards or laws. Um, you know, I look at countries like Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, um, the UK, that have been for years treating this as a real workplace safety issue, right? And you touched upon it exactly that, you know, the more procedures you're doing in, in I would say less than adequate ventilation space, you know, um, that the, the, the risks increase. And so uh, in other parts of the world, they're well ahead of saying, look, we need to put in protection for people that are working in these environments because um, let's face it, not every room is set up with a very expensive laminar flow system, right? To try to move air and, and push it away from the staff and so forth. So. Um, yeah, there, it's definitely, uh, it's a global issue, but in many respects, some of the other parts of the world are ahead of us in terms of identifying the risk and doing something to really protect those folks that are, are conducting these types of procedures. Yeah. Is, is it really as, as simple as, um, and by the way, you're right, I've, I've been in hundreds, if not thousands of offices over the years, mm -hmm. and rarely do I see any type of um, filtration, air filtration, evacuation, many of them have rather, you know, 
most of them have rather poor HVAC, let alone any kind of filtration system. Yeah. So is it as simple as a smoke filtration or evacuation system? Um, is it really just that simple? It is, yeah. And you know what? I, I'm not advocating for one solution over another. I mean, there are there are many on the market, but the, you know the the um, the idea of just you know vacuuming it away from the procedure you know uh, area, filtering it to strip out everything that we already talked about, right? So essentially, what comes out of these machines is is clean air, right? It's mm -hmm. been stripped of the the chemical aspect of it, the particulate, you know, and the biological material, and it allows you to then operate in a safe space, right? You knowing that you're managing you know, the, the plume that's being generated. It's really that easy. You know, we have folks that will rationalize a lot of things. Well, you know, I, I have a good ventilation system. We have a laminar flow, but essentially those systems are not designed to manage smoke, right? They're just not. And so, you know, having a dedicated device to be able to extract that, clean it, and then put that clean air back into the room um, you know, relatively low involvement in this, right? And you get such great results. And, you know, you mentioned um, with some of these, you know, when you go into an aesthetic center, I have always thought to myself, and, you know, you go into some facilities that are just beautiful, They, you know, high-end facilities look like gorgeous spas. And you walk and you smell that hair removal. You smell, you know, the tissue burning, right? It doesn't present itself well to the clientele either to, to be smelling, you know, the patient before you as you uh, enter a treatment room, right? Um, and I think it, there's, there's few worse smells than walking into a room without filtration where they've just done a patient's face through skin resurfacing. Yeah. That, that smell, you know, to me, I know the airborne particles are significant and I won't go in and it's surprising to me that somebody just sat there for 45 minutes, two people without any protection and just letting that airborne particle uh, flow freely into the air. And it's rancid, as you know. Yeah, no, it's it's horrible. And and, and it just, you know, it's, it's dangerous. And on top of it, you know, when you have clientele coming in, it does not present a good picture to to have that smell. Let me, you know, one of the things I get asked a lot by clinicians is uh, is uh, litigation and minimizing risk profiles in their practice. This has to be a potential risk um, for clinicians to be operating without proper filtration. Um, I, I would have to think, do you have any examples or any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, for, for many years, you know, uh, you look at organizations like OSHA, for example, that said, yes, this is a hazard. It's a known hazard, right? They have position statements on their website from the early 1990s, you know, so this joint commission and other um, accrediting bodies. You know, right now we've got a situation, you know, we've got eight different states that have enacted laws um, saying that you need to manage this across the healthcare spectrum, including aesthetic centers. Wow. Yeah. And and so, and there's a lot more coming, you know, we're, um, Utah is a good example that it's going to be, you know, fairly soon. So to me, when you look at a risk profile is that it, when, you know, uh, I, when I was Previous in my career, you know, I was involved in pressure ulcer management, you know, and once people became aware of the issue, which they are now because states are enacting laws, it's only a matter of time before, you know, the, the lawyers of the world pick up on that right, and say, what's going on, you know, in these in these areas. So, yes, we have got laws that are coming into place, you know, with eight enacted now with more coming. And the visibility across the, the spectrum, news reports and, and published articles about this continue to grow. So the awareness is there. And I always tell people that, you know, when you can't really argue that you weren't aware of it when there's um, lots of clinical evidence out there, there's state laws now that are there, there are OSHA statements that are present, CDC, NIOSH has statements. So it's really a, um, provides a lot of ammunition for legal folks to come after facilities. And all it really takes is one of the staff, one of the caregivers to come forward and say, this impacted me, right? And, and it's going to open up a, a, a really bad situation. Yeah. No question. And and really, providers don't have any defense. Uh, there's yeah. just too much information out there. And frankly, it's such an inexpensive solution. You know, here, here's another question that comes to mind is, is one of the things when I do talk about smoke, you know, smoke, uh, smoke evacuation filtration, uh, you know, the common thing is, hey, w with ACO2, you must have it. 
And then they'll say, well, what about hair removal? I'm like, you know, what people are doing hair removal, there's a lot of stuff flying around in the air. And for that matter, just about any treatment. I mean, if you're warming up tissue with an IPL, there's something, you know, possibly floating around. And yeah. so I've been trying to tell people, you know, it really doesn't matter what you're doing in an energy-based device. Um, if, if it's got any possibility of an airborne particle, you, you really need to have uh, ev evacuation and filtration. Um, and you just don't know, um, you know, there's so many different risk profiles. You could have a, a patient or, or a provider that is pregnant. Um, uh, I think the, the regulatory and legal risk factors in this day and age are just too great for something that is really an under $5,000 um, device. And even in our pre-owned world, as you know, we often sell them for 500 to thousand dollars. And sometimes I feel like I'm forcing people to pay that, um, which really leads to the kind of the next question. One of the things that's astounding to me um, is how many clinicians call me and want to know how many times they can reuse their hose on their smoke evacuation, almost as if it's an extension of the filter. And I try to explain to them that, you know, you only want to use it once. And people always challenge me on that, Joe. And you are really yeah. the world's leading expert in this space. I'm just given the fact yeah. you spent your life um, in this industry, educating and designing and teaching um, uh, and developing and patenting, as I mentioned earlier. What, what's your view on that? Should they be reused? Yeah, there, there's a couple of facets and you bring up an excellent point is that, you know, one, I've always thought that, you know, and I, I, I think it, um, we even talked about this a little bit that, you know, I've seen some really creative ways to try clean a tube, right? And an inexpensive tube, you know, and and I watch people, you know, sucking up cabbie wipes into them and swirl them around, <laughs> them. you know, so you're, you're putting a, a hose that is is really looks, um, you know, for lack of a, a better term, just gross in front of your clients right and um the other thing is too is that you're you're as we've already discussed you're suctioning in pieces of tissue sometimes a little bit of blood sometimes you know it, it could be um that you've got um a number of different substances fluids you know that are attracted inside that hose and once you turn off the vacuum and it's an under it's no longer under a, a negative type of a flow situation you know, you have organisms that could be in that hose, right? And, and you don't want staff touching that. You don't want it, you know, coming close to your next patient. Um, from a, a regulatory perspective, too, you know, the, the FDA, and, and that's the jurisdiction we fall under, right, is always viewed this as a potential risk. If we were to say that a hose could be reused, we have to provide decontamination instructions, right? We have yes. to provide cleaning procedures, autoclave procedures to ensure that you don't have organisms, you know, growing in that hose. And, and you know, I mentioned already that smoke is mostly moisture vapor, right? So you've got, you know, a hose that's now black, you're suctioning in moisture. So you've got a wet, moist environment inside of a plastic hose. There's all kinds of things that can grow in that environment. Right. And so the, the the idea of putting that in front of your next patient, regardless of you swirl a wipe around there or not, it's just not worth the, the cost or the 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 risk of doing that. And uh, it wouldn't certainly fly with any of the state laws that are, are really there now. So unilaterally, you replace the hose with every patient that is, um, you know, just the current um, correct protocol. And you believe, and I guess I believe as well, that within a matter of years, this will be the regulatory uh, uh, kind of uh, yeah. provision. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, I think I tell people, would you reuse a pair of gloves, right? You know, and try to clean, no, you you know. So you, you wouldn't do that because you're contaminating those gloves. You're contaminating the hose. It's the same situation. I wouldn't reuse a mask. I wouldn't reuse a, my gloves. I wouldn't reuse a hose that's, suctioning in contaminated material. So it, it's not about, you know, trying to sell extra hoses. It's just not a hygienic way to, to do business. And, you know, nobody wants the risk for such an inexpensive device of trying to, you know, save a few dollars and then putting your next patient at risk or your staff at risk. You know, one thing I want to kind of visualize for people that uh, aren't familiar with this, I have never seen a CO2 uh, fractionator or ablative treatment or erbium uh, whether it's fractionation or ablation in 2940 that doesn't have bloodborne particles flying into that hose. And the idea that that smoke evacuator is often just the only one in the building being used 
um, in one room for an ablative procedure, a fractionated procedure, and the next is used for something else, and that same hose is used, is really remarkable to me. And then the one thing I want to uh, kind of point out to people is being the largest pre-owned reseller in the world, we see you know, probably 10 to 20 pre-owned smoke evacuation systems a month come in here. I would say nine out of 10, nine out of 10 have hoses that are brown or black from repeated reuse. So I know that based on the devices that are coming out of service, most of the hoses are reused. Interestingly, what I find is they'll change the filter because it's forced, because it actually has a timer on it, but they'll keep using the hose, which I just find remarkable. Um, so really, I think what you're hearing both Joe and I say is everybody, you need to throw the hose away and you need to get a new hose and stop pitching pennies. One other thing I hear from time to time, Joe, this is just kind of a funny thing, kind of lightening it up a little bit is some people like, Scott, it's just so noisy. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, yeah. like, yeah, and um, it is a little noisy. And uh, so is a Zimmer and so is a laser and so is a fan on a laser. Yeah. And you know, this, you should be focusing on the work, not the noise. What are your thoughts on the noise? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, there's some, um, there are, Oftentimes with people that have been using lasers, they may have seen a system in the past. And when I first started in this industry, you know, in all fairness, um, I, you know, some of the equipment that we were selling at the time sounded like a jet engine taking off in your backyard. Yeah. You know? um, but most of the evacuators that are on the market today, you know, and the ones, you know, that we've been talking about are um, of a level that they're less than conversational tone. So one, one of the things that we, you know, as a designer are always mm -hmm. looking at now is, there's two things I never want to challenge. I don't want to challenge somebody having to speak over the evacuator or to challenge their music that they're listening to in the room. Yeah. So um, they become much quieter. And what I always tell people is give them a fresh look because what you may have used 20 years ago uh, is going to be quite a bit different today. And they're insulated better. They're, they're quieter. And the other thing is too, is that, you know, uh, i say that we kind of live in a supersized uh, society and you know like um, the fact that we turn everything up to 11 right and and you don't often need to do that so you know they all come with adjustable settings set it to a level where you're capturing the smoke you don't smell the smoke in the room you don't have to put it on maximum all the time you know so that that's another thing that people can do to to do that it, it's a tendency as we have a society to just want to turn it all the way up you don't necessarily need to do that. So the technology has improved, it's become quieter. And again, you can manage the level of flow to the amount of smoke being produced and not have to turn it all the way up in every single procedure. Let, let's switch a little bit to just the industry a little bit. Uh, you know, Buffalo uh, filtration has uh, been around for a very long time, uh, family company. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear it's Genesis. Uh, 40 employees when you joined it right outside of Buffalo, which makes sense. It's Buffalo, <laughs> Buffalo filtration. Yeah. What's, what's ConMed, you know, what, what does ConMed bring to this company? Uh, obviously you stayed with it. You've, uh, you're maintaining a senior leadership role um, in this, uh, in this group. And obviously you're excited about it. T tell, tell everybody what this is going to mean for, for, for the business and the industry and, and how it's going to impact what I always think, you know, the three critical things in healthcare, and that's the, the cost being lowered, the quality being increased, and most importantly, we see the access, the access grow. And so those are kind of the, the you know, the holy grail to me, the trinity of, of what great impact of healthcare is. And what we spend all of our time as we look at the MRP movement of what, what we're trying to do is how do we affect those things? Uh, what's ConMed's uh, acquisition uh, to this great family company going to mean to, to the market? Yeah. So, you know, what, what I think, the, you know, the missing component for Buffalo was is that we had the passion, we had the technology and, and, and the drive, you know, to solve this issue, but we didn't really have the bandwidth, right? So what, what we're able to do in, in through the combat acquisition is to invest more in technology, right? We have a, a broader R&D team to be able to really innovate and in, in outside of the scope of the small team we had in Buffalo. Uh, we have the ability to market it to a level and raise awareness, right? Educate, raise awareness, really bring this subject to the masses, if you will, through a, a larger marketing umbrella. And then finally, we just, you know, we needed more, um, you know, just uh, people out there talking about it from a clinical perspective. And, and ConMed has 
a whole clinical team that just you know goes around the country and lectures on this, talks to clinicians about it. And, and you know, we really didn't have that scale within Buffalo. So it's taking that same passion, the same knowledge that we had in the past, and then driving it across a broader um, broader scale through the, the ConMed organization. So you're gonna see a lot more of you know, this type of social media interaction, a lot more education at conferences and, and online and so forth, because to me, this is a topic that, I hate to phrase it this way, but almost like a no brainer when it comes to um, you know, doing something about this issue. And it's just a matter of getting people to stop, reflect on it and say, yeah, you know what, you're right. I, I used to always chuckle that um, I, when I started my career, I would walk by the, you know, those signs in the front of buildings that said no smoking on building grounds or facility grounds, right? And I'd be thinking to myself, that's such a, a you know, a, just not correct. You know, it's not the truth of what's actually happening inside. And so now we're able to take that message and just drive it across a broader reach through the ConMed global organization. And that's really what this cause needed. Right. It needed that bandwidth to be able to say we need to get drive this out to the masses and not just in the in the the scope of what we were able to do in a small company. So really, you know, to, to summarize and going back to the beginning of where we uh, we started, your your initial um, kind of step into this space was uh, you, know, you just didn't like what you were seeing and, and mentally smelling. Um, you knew it was uh, um, concerning and a risk profile. And here you are 30 years later. Uh, with the resources and the capital and the breach and uh, really the megaphone of ConMet to to take it to uh, uh, kind of the next level. And I think you're probably right. I think in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see uh, global, um, not just global, but mass global, um, uh, especially in the U.S. on a regional through the state basis of uh, um, the mandate of uh, smoke evacuation and filtration systems really to keep uh, you know patients and uh, uh, staff safe. This is uh, super important to us. So I think uh, ConMed has really given you now that uh, platform to go kind of finish uh, finish what you're doing. I can tell you that uh, MRP is super excited to, to be partnered with you. We uh, are quickly becoming the largest reseller of new and pre-owned equipment in the world. We're currently the largest uh, pre-owned reseller in the world. Um, and uh, we're selling over 100 pre-owned systems a month alone now. And, uh, you know, it's really our mission to make sure that uh, our customer base is incredibly well educated from a risk standpoint, a regulatory and legal standpoint, um, and just overall customer experience. Again, impacting that cost quality access component of everything that we do. And we believe um, that uh, smoke evacuation filtration is a critical part of that experience. And why we're excited is because um, you, you're going to see better and better products, at lower and lower cost, uh, where we can continue to do the things we're doing, our mission of compressing the supply chain to make sure that these products are affordable and become not something that, hey, they're really stretching and don't know if they can pay for it. But you know what? We've made it so affordable that it just is it, just, to your point, kind of a no-brainer. You got to do it. And that's what we're really excited about. And, and we're, as we look at the rest of 22 and into 23, um, we really want to make this uh, where almost every device that goes out has a, uh, a ConMed Buffalo device with it. And uh, uh, so that's what we're really pleased with. And, and we think that it, these kinds of decisions that we're making to make this a front and center, not an afterthought, a front and center right out of the gate. This is a bundled tool like every other tool that you're purchasing, that this will create a lot more awareness where people go, you know, I have to have it. And we know that this is a business that pollinates. So there's a lot of turnover in this industry, not in a bad way, just people are migrating and moving around. We also know that our uh, employee base has kind of a two-year thought process on their employer. Uh, they're no longer looking at the 10, 20 years like you and I do. Uh, they're looking at uh, how can they impact over a couple of years. And we know that the best practices, Joe, that we teach and educate people on, they're going to go to the next practice and pollinate and, and educate there as well. So we know that this is a pay it forward program, which is all about what MRP is doing. And, and we're super excited to be a part of uh, ConMed and, and your commitment to work with us. Yeah, no, and I'm excited as well. I mean, it's it's a not only a business, but it's a great cause to get behind as well, right? I mean, I think often about if you know my 
my wife, my my sister, you know, my brother was going in, in to do these types of procedures, would I want them to go in and do it unprotected? And, you know, the other part of it is too, is that, you know, once facilities start to utilize this equipment, it's hard to go back, you know, to, to smoke filled rooms. And, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's a shift in, in, you know, their, their mindset. And once they become accustomed to it, it's, it's just, you can't go back um, and you can't turn back. So we're excited to be a part of it as well. We love what you're doing and, um, you know, you, you taking up this cause as well. And, you know, we're here to support that and support the, the, the folks that you, um, you know, your clientele and who you're supporting in the field. Everybody, thank you uh, uh, for spending time with us today. Again, our guest is uh, Joe Lynch. He's uh, Vice President of OEM Sales for ConMed, uh, one of our new partners at MRP. Joe, thank you for taking uh, the afternoon and, and spending an hour with us to kind of walk through some of these questions and bring them front and center to the uh, to the market. And uh, looking forward to seeing you over the next couple of weeks and months as we're out back in the field uh, post-COVID. All right. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Joe.